Bueno, muchas gracias por esperar uh, hasta que resolvemos este problema y muchas gracias por la invitación nuevamente a los organizadores por dar estos kinos. Estoy contento de estar aquí. Como dijo Jorge antes, la sesión de apertura ha sido, han sido años muy duros durante la, uh, el tema de la pandemia. Incluso algunos de nuestros colegas han fallecido y no están aquí con nosotros. Así que me gustaría uh, dar estos, uh, esta presentación en honor de nuestros uh, de miembros importantes de, de comunidad Chivo de África y Wilmer Carvajal, que era un uh, miembro uh, regional de nuestra red. Y hay uh, algún, uh, una cosa que Wilmer me enseñó, mi amigo, en mi visita a Perú, es que es que el mejor pisco sour no es en Chile, es en realidad en Perú. Probablemente algunos de ustedes ya lo han probado anoche. Pero por, por favor, cuídense. Después de los cuatro o cinco uh, van a estar en problemas. Así que para mantener su atención, creo que uh, ya estamos cerca de la hora del almuerzo. He organizado mi charla como un viaje uh, a través de los diferentes cócteles. Probablemente no va a encontrar algunos de estos en bares peruanos, pero les puedo dar las recetas después, si quieren. Vamos a hablar sobre la... Sí, la natural uh, analogs, el natural de, laboratory, de, local adaptive, and the last one, which is, uh, I call, everything is changing, even the analogs. So first, I mean, so basic definitions about what are actually natural analogs. Uh, natural analogs can be defined as those regions which in the past or even in the present already experienced those climate conditions expected for the future. So it's a concept that was initially introduced by people dealing with uh, climatic issues. And for some of us that we are conducting experiments at the laboratory, in, in some cases it's very difficult to try to mimic all the conditions in the field. And of course, sometimes we are neglecting, you know, interspecific interaction among different species, the adaptation process, and especially even behind now, we have some facilities for trying to mimic the natural variability in some laboratories. It's still very difficult to try to mimic all the different variability at different temporal scales. So by using natural analogs, we can explore the chronic exposure to high CO2 natural populations interacting with, within a local community. And therefore, we can use this information from a scaling our result from physiology to ecological and evolutionary processes. So if we go back to the definition of natural analogs, something that is, 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 is really difficult is try to explore how uh, conditions are uh, expected in the future, especially with coastal in coastal habitats like subtidal environments, intertidal areas. So that moves into the next cocktail. So, uh, and there's something that is really important. So in, in, for the open ocean, I mean, it's, just, it's still a little bit easier to, to have an idea about the future conditions because we can use, you know, predictions about changes in the uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. But for the coastal system, we have a so big variability and I just put an, ex an example, for instance, the, the trend of increasing carbon dioxide from the stratus buoy uh, almost in the open ocean area in front of another part of Chile, and the time series of uh, carbon dioxide from our instruments in the southern Patagonia in, in Chile. And you can see that, I mean, with three or four years of data, it's quite difficult to try to understand the evolutions of ocean acidification in coastal systems. And we require at least long-term, you know, all, I mean, long data longer than 10 years. So that's implied that uh, for monitoring, ocean acidification requires patience, you know, while natural variability or natural analogs not. So uh, in, in this sense, ocean acidification is a very important topic, but in occasions, in order to communicate to stakeholders, it's extremely important to keep in mind that this is a process that is occurring in a long time scale. So probably you generally will need data for 10 or 20 years in order to have some information about the trending of the changes. And of course, by using, you know, honest techniques, probably for 60 years, you are going to be to, to catch some trends and changes of, uh, of pH 
uh, for, I don't know, 50 or 60 years. But by using, you know, high technology or sensor for a couple of months or even a years, it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to try to have an idea about how changing conditions are, are occurring. So, well, there's many examples of natural analogs of future ocean acidification for coastal habitats. We can, we, I will show you some examples for estuaries, river plumes, I mean, the bottom waters in Cal Forest, the CO2 seeps, and coral reefs, so tidal, especially tidal pools. I will show the extreme conditions in tidal pools, and, uh, but also coastal upwelling areas. So, I really enjoyed this paper published by Lydia Kasperger and, and Cyronac because uh, it, it put in context you know, to almost permanent exposition depending on the drivers, like metabolism between day and night, the events of upwelling that can occur on a time scale of a couple of days or even a week, or intense flux of low alkalinity river in waters in the coastal area. And then you have the long train of decades of data to, for exploring the ocean acidification. So, but the next question is, are these low pH, high conditions common in the coast? And I will try to convince you that you probably have a low pH environment or natural analogs probably very close to, to your house. And the best example is tidal pools. I mean, tidal pools are everywhere, and especially intertidal areas. And they experience huge variations in, in carbon dioxide between day and night, basically because the impact of the local community. And a couple of years ago, my student, Fernando, was curious about changes of uh, carbon dioxide in this tidal pool. He was almost sleeping on a tent on the rocky shore for a couple of days, collecting samples at the night and day. But it was very interesting. I mean, you can see, I mean, during the day, it's under saturated condition of 200, 300 micro atmosphere. But at the night, it can increase that more than 2,000 in a tidal pool. And even if you move to the adjacent rocky shore channels, even carbon dioxide is quite high. I mean, it's, it's almost 800 micro atmosphere. Today, with the advance of technology and using loggers and sensors for monitoring pH, you, we can understand, I mean, how natural fluctuations are occurring in this kind of environment. And I really like this paper by Kennedy Wolf because it's uh, evidencing the changes of pH especially in the mid-intertidal sites with pH levels that can reach values around 7.5, 7.4. And the difference between this tidal environment is basically driven by the community structure. I mean, just for instance, calcifiers versus algae. And depending on the community structure is going to depend on the local metabolism that is uh, generating this kind of fluctuations. Kelp forest is also a good example of ocean acidification analogs, especially in, in deeper waters. So for many years, kelp forests have been considered as an ocean acidification refugee. But in this paper by Heidi Hirsch and GGR recently published, it's very nice because they put different sensors from surface to the bottom, oxygen, pH, and then you can see that, of course, in the canopy area, you can find under saturated conditions of very low carbon dioxide. And, but if you move to the basal disk in the deep environment, you can see that the carbon dioxide is very high. And even you can find under saturated conditions in omega. So probably it's a refugee for a fish living in the canopy. But the world is completely different for a crab or for a sea urchin in the, in the, in the basal disk. So, but also, give information about that is not the same if you are collecting a, 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 a seawater for characterizing carbon chemistry at the surface than in the bottom. But even in this kind of environment, you have the influence of regional processes, like the upwelling. So even in the kelp forest, you can have, for instance, during a couple of days, the impact of the upwelling within the kelp forest. In some cases, the daily cycle can be lost due to the effect of the permanent exposition to low pH waters. So that is very really interesting, considering, for instance, for experiments. So coastal upwelling areas have a, a big signature in, at, at, the, at the regional level. There are many coastal upwelling uh, regions, 
experience low pH and high CO2 conditions in some areas at seasonal scales, but at other latitudes you can have almost permanent exposition. There are very, very, a lot of examples of a study trying to characterize the carbon chemistry in abwellings. I just put some examples, for instance, from a paper from CAI in Nature Communications, and my, my colleague, uh, Martin Hernando Sayon, recently published this paper in Frontiers, where you can see that in, in the coastal waters in front of um, Miraflores, probably, you have very high CO2 and low pH waters. Um, but, if we, if, we move, if we move to the south in the southern hemisphere or to the north in the, in the northern hemisphere, and then we, we have the influence of the river runoff, even in coastal abwelling areas. So you have river influence coastal abwelling areas, and they are a kind of natural laboratory for experiment because you have all the different combination of drivers. For instance, during the spring summer, you have the influence of the river and the abwelling, and then in winter, only the river, and then if you move to the summer, probably only you have the abwelling effect as a main driver. I just want to show you some examples from different areas quite far away each other. Like, for instance, the South China Sea in this paper by Dong. Uh, he demonstrated, for instance, the effect of upwelling in low pH waters and creating conditions of low omega dagonites. But at the same time, in the surface, you have the influence of low alkalinity waters that generate conditions also of low pH conditions. The same if we move to central Chile. So we have in the spring summer the upwelling of low pH and low omega aragonite waters, but at the same time, rivers in the surface create conditions of low pH, at least in the first two, three meter depth. And even if you use, for instance, stable isotopes in the IC, it's a very useful tool because you can separate the effect of the both drivers, I mean the upwelling and the river because the signature of the DIC in river and water is completely different in terms of the isotopic signature in comparison to the uh, more oceanic waters. Well, but if you move down to the deep waters, we can also find, you know, ocean acidification analogs. And oxygen minimum sun, they are a very good examples of low pH, high CO2 conditions with a supposed low variability in this kind of environments. But recently, by conducting an expedition to the um, anoxic, low pH anoxic marine zone of northern Chile, we can find that the anoxic marine zones are not so stable as expected. There are huge differences, and it's very dynamic. And this dynamic depends in, in great part of the microbial pathway. Because on occasions, sulfur driven dark carbon fixation, for instance, can slow down or can reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in this kind of environment. So we need to keep in consideration the different microbial processes occurring in oxygen minimum sun. Well, my postdoc, Montserrat Aldunate, indeed is going to talk, and I think in, on Thursday, about the, the influence of dark carbon fixation, for instance, in this kind of environment. Well, but then we move even deeper. I mean, I, 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 had, I had the pleasure to be part in the organization of the first expedition to the Atacama Trench. We're talking about eight kilometers deep. And then, by using technology for collecting samples at this depth, we were able for collecting samples for alkalinity and DIC at 8,000 meter depth. And then for the first time, we have a profile of carbon dioxide condition in this trench. And you can see, that there are two different layers in the oceans. One layer which is dominated mostly by the biology and oceanographic processes, and there is a layer in deep waters which, which processes and carbon chemistry are mostly dominated by the effect of the pressure. There's a nice documentary about these expeditions. If there's something, someone is interested, I can give you the link if you want to, to take a look at, the, at, the, at this very nice expedition in this environment. Well, well. In La Oca region, in Latin America, we have different kind of ocean acidification analogs um, with the support of OICC and other sponsor. We had the possibility in 2018 to organize uh, a, an ocean acidification school in Galapagos and by using, you know, natural analogs for the understanding the impact of ocean acidification. In this case, a CO2 seeps in Roca Redonda, which is a, a kind of a small algae sorry, a small island in the northern part of, the, of, of Galapagos. So 
but then through the collaboration with colleagues from Central America, for instance, we are also trying to understand the carbon chemistry in mangroves. So I was just two months ago uh, working with my colleagues, Carlos Vergara, Chen, uh, trying to understand the carbon chemistry in mangroves. And it's amazing because you have, they have a natural laboratory for experiments. In the inner part of the mangrove, you can find very high carbon dioxide levels, more than 1,000 microatmosphere. And then if you move to the adjacent ocean, I mean, the water is all more undersaturated. But in all this range of variation, you have the same species, Anadara. I don't know, well, Anadara is a, is a, is a, is a Bible, it's a clam, which is distributed from, from Peru to Tumbes uh, to, to almost Mexico. So, and well, the ceviche is very good, so if you have the possibility to try with Anadara, please do it. Okay, so basically in the, in, the, in, the, in the coastal area, we have a pH sea escapes um, with different range of natural variability depending on the environment, from tidal pools, intertidal areas, subtidal environments, river plume and estuaries, oxygen minimum zone, adult environments, and the open oceans. And then if you put inside, you know, this variability, we have animals, we have organisms living in, in all these different kind of conditions that you need to keep in consideration when you want to do an experiment for evaluate the impact of low pH, high CO2. So that moves into the next cocktail. I call this one the experimental cocktail. So, I mean, we have a natural laboratory for doing experiments. And I really, I mean, this is a paper relatively old, but I really like this picture by Joe Salisbury and, and Balbuser and Salisbury because it put in context, you know, the wide range of variability of processes occurring in the coastal ocean from tides, you know, journal uh, tides, storms, upwelling, river runoff to Milankovitch cycles or geological scales. So, and, the, and this is very interesting because you can see that there's a decreasing frequency and magnitude of contribution if you move, you know, to large-scale processes like ocean acidification. So that is very important when we want to put the context in terms of our biological questions. Exploring systems, for instance, are very good ocean acidification analogs for doing experiments. This is a paper published by uh, Natalia Osma uh, in the exploring system in the southern part of Chile, where, which is characterized by um, low alkalinity, low pH waters. And, and in this experiment, she collected, you know, a natural phytoplankton assemblage for conducting experiments of exposition to two different levels of CO2 at around 400 and 800 microatmosphere, and well, even at community level, natural phytoplankton assemblage seems to be adapted to this environment. We didn't find any changes in primary productivity, in community structure, in abundance and biomass, because those communities are already exposed to high carbon dioxide. This is a, a very nice paper that was recently published by, by, by Nina. Uh, probably, I don't know, probably she, she's going to give a talk related, I think, to, to, to the role that have predictability in the response of marine organisms. She was working with two model species, the Pacific and native oysters, and by manipulating the seawater and creating conditions of a static pH and dynamic fluctuations, she have found, for instance, that the shell dissolution in these oysters increased with larger amplitude in pH variability and less predictable conditions. So it's a very nice study that evidence that fluctuated habitats with increasing amplitude of variability can pre-expose to organisms to lower pH um, values more frequently and for prolonged uh, accumulative durations. So in Chile, we have used, for instance, for experiments, the river influence areas, because typically river plumes experience low pH and carbon dioxide levels. And in this paper, um, published by uh, Luisa Saavedra, for instance, she was collecting mussels from, this, from two different environments, river influence area and non-river influence area and then exposing at the laboratory to three different levels of carbon dioxide for evaluating the ingestion rate and respiration. And you can see that populations coming from low pH river had higher feeding rates with no significant effects of PCO2 on the feeding. So by increasing ingestion, it seems that they are interested to compensate 
the demand for keeping metabolic costs in this environment, because we can see that respiration rate is almost the same for both populations. Later, we do the same experiment by using the environment as a laboratory, by conducting transplant experiments. Transplant experiments are very useful in order to explore, for instance, the cost of local adaptation. So and in this experiment, we, we do experiment of autotransplant and transplantation of organisms from river influence area to non-river influence area. And you can see that those muscles in areas affected for, by freshwater runoff have high growth rate and higher calcification rates. And when you move organisms from control areas to river influence areas, they increase also the growth and calcification. So it seems that food supply can play a significant role but because typically in estuarine areas and river influence areas, you have a very large amount of cestone and particles for feeding. Indeed, if you take a look at a modest satellite image of phytoplankton, you can see the high productivity, especially in river plume areas like this. So there's uh, good examples that uh, food can you know, alleviate the impact of low pH conditions. And my colleague, Victor Aguilera, is going to talk about the effects of food, for instance, in the response of copepods organisms in, in a talk. So you can do the same, I mean, but in terms of the vertical structure, not only comparing I mean, low pH areas and control areas, but you can see both treatments in the vertical sense. And fjord systems are very good examples. Because in the surface layer, you can find low alkalinity and no omega conditions due to the effects of river runoff. And then in the deep water, you have the effect of the respiration of the organic matter. But you have an optimum omega in a middle layer between two and six meter depth that can be used, for instance, for the shellfish farming industry. And we do experiments one year later for conducting transplant experiments in order to evaluate if really this layer of omega Aragonite conditions is the optimum for growth. And we can find that indeed, if you move organisms from the surface to this optimal layer, they grow better and they have a big shells. So this is very useful information because the knowledge of this natural variability can be used as an opportunity for adaptation of shellfish farmers of an ocean acidification impact. So adaptation is a very important role for organisms. And between 2009 and 2014, we were conducted with a group of colleagues different experiments of common garden by collecting animals along a very large environmental gradient from northern part of Chile, central and the southern part of Chile, and exposed to high CO2 conditions in the laboratory. At that time, we didn't have any idea about the carbon dioxide levels in the coast. But a couple of years later, we do the monitoring of conditions along this environmental gradient, and we have found that most of the organisms that we expose in the laboratory to high CO2, they were already living in a low pH environment. So by using this information, what some of my, of my colleagues, we, we did um, a kind of index, you know, that represent, I mean, how far organisms were exposed in the laboratory in comparison with the local habitat. And then you can see that those organisms experienced a large variation from the local condition where those experienced the more negative impact. Just recently, in the last year, with, uh, with some colleagues and, and, and Sam Dubon, Juan Diego Gaetan and others, we try to test this hypothesis, but in a global context, by using information of carbon dioxide in the cost by different buoys, sensors, data, you know, from data repositories. And then we did a meta-analysis of different experimental study exposing organisms to high CO2 with information about what, what, what was the geographic area where they were collected. And they found the same relationships. So a significant relationship between our index and the mean biological response, response suggests that the impact of a given experimental scenario depend basically of the deviation of the upper CO2 level in the habitat or in the region. And even when you explore, you know, the impact on the different traits of study, those traits directly, I mean, more affected were those related with fitness, like growth, reproduction, and especially survival. 
But the bad news is that we also found that from our meta-analysis that almost 50% of the study underestimate the impact of ocean acidification because they basically were exposing organisms to carbon dioxide conditions what, uh, where populations were already living. I mean, so, well, I mean, organisms are in, in some way like Stretch Armstrong are not invisible. I mean, they are, they are, they are plastic, but, but uh, I mean, about increasing carbon dioxide and temperature in the coastal water, m most of the organisms have limits for physiological plasticity uh, in the coast, like our friend Stretch Armstrong. So by using, for instance, you know, performance curves, we can explore, for instance, the limits of physiological plasticity. This is just an example, for instance, using the coast of Peru and comparing population A with population B exposed to different ranges of natural variability. And then we can understand, you know, and get valuable information for exploring consequences of changing ocean conditions. My PhD student, Nicole, is going to show at the poster 18, for instance, the performance um, in, in terms of ingestion rates, respiration, and survival of different populations of mussel living in different environments in the, in the southern part of Chile. And you can see that the performance score for all those different populations are, are completely different because they have a different history of exposition to different natural variability regimes. So by combining this information, for instance, with genetic, you may have an idea, you know, about the influence of the low pH conditions in this kind of ocean acidification analogs as a selective process in each populations. We are doing some of these kind of experiments, for instance, using upwelling filaments and upwelling shadows, because you can have in a small scale and mesoscale areas different variability regimes. I mean, with a difference of, I don't know, 100 kilometers or something like this. But, well, ocean acidification analogs are not stable, are also changing. And there's many examples that the uh, ocean acidification are changing due to the impact of, uh, of the influence of the land. So my PhD student, Elizabeth Cura, for instance, was evaluating the impact of the color dissolved organic matter exported from rivers with different land uses. And by, uses, by using satellite information, she has found that the, depending on the land use, you have different signature of color dissolved organic matter in the coast, which is affecting, for instance, the carbon chemistry. And in the southern part of Chile, she has found, for instance, that changing land use can increase the flux of dissolved organic matter to the coast, modifying the carbon chemistry in the coastal environments. Recently, Carstensen and Carlos Duarte were evaluating the drivers of pH variability in coastal systems by using long time series of more than 50 years in different areas, like the, I mean, Northern Europe, US coast. And well, it was very difficult to identify any trend in the coast. But when they were trying to correlate with productivity, of the nutrient flux, they have found that the eutrophication may play a significant role in the pH variability in the coast. Recently, in this paper in PNS, Kesori was doing a simulation exercise by exploring the impact of the nutrient flux to the coastal area, which increased primary productivity on the biomass, but then decreasing the oxygen, and then increasing respiration, and they found a decrease in pH due to the impact of the eutrophication in this environment. Oxygen minimum zone are expanding and carbon chemistry is also changing in habitat conditions. And we know in Peru and Chile very well that the, that the upwellings is increasing, both in intensity and the durations. So basically we have different drivers of changing pH conditions in the coast and ocean acidifications, changes in the upwelling regimes, the impact of changing land uses and the freshwater chemistry, the modifications of the hydrological cycles due to the impact of damming or climate change impacts, but also pollution intensity is very important drivers of changing pH conditions 
And then we have ocean acidification, which is almost at the same time in scale in this picture. And all those processes of changing conditions are impacting communities in the coast. So during the last years, we have put up many efforts to try and to identify or monitoring the target of ocean acidification, like the, the target 14.3. But you have to consider that the, we, we, we need also to be worried about other SDG, not only the 14, because for instance, climate change is important, but you need to keep in consideration the changing land uses, because it's also modifying the pH condition or the hydrological cycles, but also keeping healthy rivers is very important. So to reduce the impact of changing CO2 conditions require multiple actions. And this is very important, for instance, in the context, in the context of ocean alkalinity enhancement, because rivers have a major influence in the alkalinity in the coastal zone, and regulatory policies for keeping healthy river alkalinity discharging to coastal ocean could be a key component of actions dealing with mitigation of ocean acidification, like this paper recently published that gives an example of how increasing river alkalinity can slow down the impact of ocean acidifications in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So with my colleagues Nelson Dragos, we are, uh, uh, or, or we are leading you know, uh, efforts for a, for a special number in sustainability also um, about these kind of issues like adaptations and solutions for coastal sustainability. So keep in mind, I mean, it's, the deadline is in February next year, if someone of you are interested to send your manuscript. So some of my take home messages are ocean acidification analogs are globally distributed worldwide, not only in its boundary system, uh, like some people think. Exposition to low pH and high CO2 of marine population in these analogs is habitant dependent. So you have to be considered when you design experiments. The importance of communicate key correct message. Are you conducting experiments of low pH really or ocean acidifications? Well, this is also a very important issue. There's many drivers of changing pH in the coastal domain interact with ocean acidifications. And one of the big challenge is evaluate the contribution from each drivers of changes. So coastal management and OA actions require consider the balance between the negative consequence of eutrophication, pollution, versus those driven by increasing uh, this, uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide in OA in order to maintain biodiversity and ecosystem services of our coastal marine ecosystem. I want to thank you, my, all my students, assistants, postdocs, and especially the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation for giving support to participate in this meeting and all my collaborators. Thank you very much. <laughs>